Hello and welcome to another video from Adrian David Pure Electric. In this video, I'm going to be talking about training into the industry, routes into the industry, namely how to become an electrician, because it, the more I'm in this industry, the more I'm starting to find out that a, um, an electrician and a domestic installer are not the same thing. So I'm going to do a series of videos. Uh, and in this video, here is the content that I'm going to be talking through. So I'm going to talk about my experience um, getting into industry. Uh, the overall plan is going to be to talk about the routes into the industry and, and comparing them. I'll start by showing you the IET Wiring Matters PDF, which talks about electrical qualifications, talks about electrics, electricians and domestic installers uh, and approved electricians. And then I'll talk about what constitutes a qualified professional electrician, which is a recent post by Ruth Devine, uh, Managing Director of SDJ Electrical and Chair of the TESP. Then using the Electrical Careers website, I'm gonna talk through the recognized routes into the industry. So the recognized routes are the electrical apprentice. The apprenticeships are three years at college, four days a week training on the job, um, endpoint assessment, AM2, and you've got the full-time courses and evening courses. So that's either three days a week at college or two evenings a week at college over the same, uh, over three years. Um, but you're not in the industry at the same time, quite possibly, or you're training around another job. And then at the end of that, you've still got the NVQ, the portfolio and the AM2 to do. Whereas with the apprenticeship, it's all tied in a nice bundle, in a bow. Um, then there's going to be uh, experience worker route, which I'll talk about. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to talk about that in more in depth uh, in a later video, because I agree with the principle of the experience worker route. You know, people like myself who have got um, modules missing out of their qualifications um, can then back tread, back pedal and be still become electricians. So you don't lose the ability to be to be to become a, a, a recognized uh, electrician within the industry. However, I can see at, in its current form that it could, could easily be uh, manipulated um, by the colleges that are effectively giving the training because most of it is left up to them to decide who's coming into the industry. Uh, and it, in my own personal opinion, it kind of looks like a way that the industry is trying to clean up its mess. So basically we've got loads of people that the, um, the industry doesn't see as electricians, domestic installers or people such as myself that haven't got that final qualification. And it wants to clean up that mess as quietly as possible by getting everyone to the apprenticeship standard by getting them through the AM2. Now the only downside to that qualification is that it doesn't take into account previous training. So it does something called a skill scan and literally it's just a tick box exercise, tick box exercise, which I'll talk about in another video a bit on this one as well. But then once I've spoken about that, I'm also going to talk about why domestic electrical installations are seen as a lesser form of electricity. Uh, I'll give you a case study of mine and a few others in the industry and just show you that electricity is dangerous whatever industry it's in. I mean, obviously with 400 volts, uh, that lowers the impedance of your body and arc flash um, is a lot higher and stuff like that. You know, I get that. But when you talk about milliamps killing people, it doesn't matter whether it's 230 or 400, it makes no difference. So that's where we're going to go with this video. Hopefully it will be of use to some people. I mean, the main reason why I'm doing this video is to save people suffering the same fate as myself, basically. And then I've got some more videos to come. So in my next video, I'm going to discuss the domestic installer route in detail. I'm going to talk about um, the courses, what's on offer, the costs, the guided learning hours, which are massively different from uh, industry, uh, the apprenticeships, the recognised route into the industry. Uh, I mean, give you an idea of, of the difference in the guided learning hours. Uh, a typical uh, apprenticeship is 750 guided learning hours with a total qualification time of about just over a thousand, I think it is, whereas a domestic installer is a hundred hours. Okay, and I'll talk around those problems. I'll talk around fast track training and talk about what I, th I see the problems as being. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about measuring competence and why we talk about people being competent 
not so much qualified and what the, the problem is with that, in my opinion. I'm then going to discuss the devaluing of the devaluing of the industry because all of these things do have an impact. OK, if you devalue something, it becomes worthless. It becomes worth less money. And electricians wages haven't gone up uh, in over 10 years, I would say. I saw I watched a YouTube video back in 2011. Electricians were striking because of Besna and it was saying that electricians were on 16 pounds an hour. I mean, this is 2021 now, so that's back in 2011. It's now 2021. Ten years later, electricians' wages have dropped, OK? And there were more people in the industry that are unqualified, I would say, than there are qualified electricians. Um, so, you know, there is, a, there is a devaluing that is going on, and I'll discuss all that in, the, in that video later on. I'm then going to do a video on Park Pier, the building regulations, and uh, where it came from, what are the issues around it, and what does it all mean effectively so that people looking to come into the industry can, can get an understanding of what it means and hopefully some homeowners can understand what it all means for them because ultimately it's their responsibility. I'm then also going to do a video on why these companies, um, and I won't name them just yet, but why there are companies that appear to be supporting other companies with one hand, but then actively uh, talking out against them in the other hand, but all the while still supporting them. So, you know, there's there's a few videos that we're going to bring up. Hopefully together we'll go on this journey. Um, I don't have all the answers, okay? I'm literally one person looking through this with fresh eyes, okay? So we're going to come up with things as and when. We're also going to go on this journey of discovery together. So as we grow together, you guys will point out things that I had maybe haven't noticed or seen. And together we'll be, build a bigger picture, which will hopefully, and the idea of this whole video series is to hopefully enable people to make the right choice when they're coming into this industry, okay? One of the main things that I wanna get across is that not all roads are equal, okay? And it's really difficult to tell the difference. Um, I get a lot of people emailing me saying they've paid £6,000 for a domestic installer course that was supposed to make them qualified electricians. And now they are no longer, you know, they're no further ahead. They, they've lost direction. The college have let them go. And, you know, they, they don't know what to do. And they're not alone. There are many people like that. So, on the left here, I've got the traditional apprenticeship, and these are just some things that I wrote down. There may be a little bit more to it or, or, or what, but you know, I tried to get the main bones of it down. So the first thing is that it's industry approved. So it is recognized by the industry as being an electrician if once you've done this course. They can be City and Guilds or EAL awarded. Uh, City and Guilds is the brand name, EA, EAL or a bit you know, more unknown. Um, more like maybe the RAC, so City and Guilds may be AA, EAL, RAC, and then you get other people like uh, Logic Training perhaps that might be more like a green flag, you know, they're, they're in the background um, trying to compete with the big boys maybe, I don't know um, too much about it, but you know, you don't hear so much of them. Um, typically 48 months, one day a week at college, but most importantly, four days a week on site learning the trade that you are doing. So you're not only getting that one day in college, learning your trade at college, you know, the, 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 the theories and the principles behind it. But then on four days on site, getting taught best practice by hopefully a qualified electrician that has seen it all, done it all, and will share their stories with you and help cement their ethics into you. OK. It then finishes off with the AM2S endpoint assessment, which for anyone that may have looked at that assessment, it is the minimum safe standard that anyone should be able to go into the, into the contracting world uh, and install electrical installations because it's, it, it really isn't that difficult. You install, I think everything that you, you need to install is kind of on, already on the wall. There's a tiny bit of uh, trunk, uh, conduit to do, a bit of uh, plastic and metal conduit. Mainly, you just got to wire it up and you should be able to do that at that point. And anyone that can, cannot pass that assessment should not be working on electrical installations. It's as simple as that. It is the minimum. And bearing in mind that, you know, these guys have only done three days a week 
uh, sorry, three years at college to get to that point, it is a fair assessment at their ability. Which again, when I come to talk about the experience worker route, where you've got to have five years experience in the, in the industry, that assessment should be more difficult. Um, it shouldn't be the same assessment as what these apprentices are doing after three, after three years. Uh, more importantly as well with this apprenticeship route, it is JIB recognised, so you should be able to get a gold card fairly simply off of this. And as I said before, the total guided learning hours for this course is 743. The total qualification time is 1,040. Now, I want to draw your attention to those figures because when you're considering your route into the industry, you need to compare apples with apples, okay? If you are doing a three-year course, total qualification time, 1,040 hours, okay? That gets you to a level that the industry are happy to call you an electrician. If you do a lesser course, which is faster, but costs more money, you need to be aware that something is missing. Okay, so these domestic installer courses typically are around 100 hours. How can you go from 1,040 hours to 100 hours? And I hear a lot of people say that it's because electricians do domestic, industrial, commercial. I've never heard so much rubbish in my whole entire life because it doesn't matter whether you're installing domestic, or industrial or commercial, the principles are still the same. An electrician should be able to transfer those skills from one industry to another. If you're moving from domestic to industrial or commercial, yes, there will be a period of adjustment where you've got to learn that new criteria for, for, for what you're installing it, but it would be very simple for somebody that's an electrician. You shouldn't be then sold a further course to then be able to move into industrial commercial. It shouldn't work like that. Um, it's it's profiteering in some in some ways and people aren't getting a great deal. A lot of knowledge is missing at the moment because of that. So when you're comparing these courses, have a look at the guided learning hours and the total qualification time. Compare apples with apples. If you want to be an electrician, these are the total qualification time hours that you want to be looking at. Finally, it finishes with you being qualified as an electrician. It is recognized and respected by employers. Okay, so when you think about domestic installer courses, a lot of employers will not take someone on that's done a domestic installer course. Um, a lot of these companies advertise the fact that you will end up being self-employed. Okay, and then you're really in trouble because you don't know what you don't know and you just install what you think you've been taught to install with no one checking your work or backing you up um, or saying, do you know what, you're, you're doing that wrong. Why don't you do this? You know, you kind of get left to your own devices and uh, you know, where, where does that go? That, 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 that can't be good for the industry. So again, that'll probably come in the devaluing video that I'll do. So let's compare that to the domestic installer. Sometimes five, 15, 18 day training. I've seen um, some over six months every other weekend. The outcome is usually the same. Um, it's not recognized by most employers, as I said. Most people end up self employed. You can find them as sitting guilds and EAO accredited. Uh, sometimes the com training company pay to use the logo. So it may not be an actual sitting guilds course. So, for instance, I've put there the 4141 01 course. That doesn't show up on the City and Guilds website. So any employer looking for that qualification, it won't show up because it's an in-house qualification. The training provider that has come up with that course, it's their course. They just get to use the City and Guilds badge. Um, and again, you know, who knows? I shouldn't comment too much. Um, and you, what, one of the things you guys need to know is that these Part P courses were originally set up for other trades. So not for electricians, but other trades such as gas engineers to be able to connect up a boiler without having to get an electrician in and incur costs or a kitchen fitter to move a socket or simply connect up an oven or something like that. That is all they were designed to do. And when they first came out, you had defined scope, which was literally move a socket, that kind of level. And you had full scope, which meant you could run a new circuit or change a consumer unit. And somewhere along the line, someone thought it'd be a great idea to get rid of that and just have domestic installer can do everything. And it, it's, it's 
made some huge problems, which I'll talk about through this series of videos. Okay, so my experience. I was 2021 guys um, and looking, looking to change career. I'd been stuck in a dead end job for a while. Um, you know, I'd left college, done a few different things, um, being a mechanic, being a welder, manager of a shop, you know, a few things. I ended up working at a petrol station as a filling job and I was only living for the weekend at the time. And I'd been there a year and I remember it to this day, my, my manager saying to me that there's your wages, you've been here a year. And I was like, bloody hell, how did that happen? I need to get out of this. So I instantly opened up the Evening Argus, which is our local paper, and started looking for it. And I came across an advert for our local college, which at the time was City College Brighton and Hove. And it said, you know, become an electrician, earn 40 grand a year. And I thought, you know what, that's, that's about what I'd like to earn. That would, that would be comfortable. And I can tell you now, I don't think I've ever earned that in the whole of my career, no matter how hard I've worked. Um, but that's a different story. But what I didn't realise when I chose that course was, there, was that there were different routes into the industry which had different outcomes. OK, so the first outcome that I'm going to talk about is the apprenticeship route, which is the all signal dancing Rolls Royce way into the industry. The next is the diploma route, which unknowingly I took. Um, because I wasn't working with an electrical company at the time. So I wanted to get my foot in the door. I wanted to get on the course and show that I was ready to, to work and committed. So I paid for the course myself. It was about 600 pounds, I think at the time. Um, and I know it's increased to about eight or 900 a year now, which isn't matters of money if you look at the cost of domestic and store routes. But um, what that involved was two nights a week at college. And then you do basically the exams and you do the coursework at college. So exams and the, the learning theory behind it. At the end of that three years, what I didn't know was that there was more to be done. There was a, a, an MVQ portfolio logbook, whatever you want to call it, that had to be filled out. And basically that's when you're on site, you, um, you write about a job that you're doing, you take some photos to prove that it's you and, and you talk technically and prove that you have the ability to be an electrician. And once that's completed, you go in for the endpoint assessment, which is the AM2, uh, which is the assessment that I spoke about before. And no one ever told me that. The other problem with my course was, which I need to make sure that you guys are aware of if you're watching this video, is that not all colleges are very good at keeping on top of their paperwork. So the college that I was with, for instance, I was doing all these, all these days. I never missed a day. I was there every time. Uh, I went with my friend, you know, as well, every time. So we went together, best friend at the time. And I was getting all these certificates through. Every time I did a, an exam, a couple of weeks later, I got a certificate through. So I've got loads of them. So I'm thinking, oh, this is brilliant. Happy days. Get to the end of the course on the last day, shaking hands. Thank you very much for all your help. Um, when you know the, the training's bad, when in the third year, you know more than the, the lecturer training you. And that's something else that you guys need to be careful. There's a lot of people teaching that aren't even electricians or they've never been in the industry or they haven't got any experience. They've literally qualified and then gone straight into teaching. So they don't have anything that they can then hand over to you. So be careful of that as well. Um, but at the end of that, we all said goodbye. And three years ago, so this was nearly 15 years later, I found out that I'm not actually qualified because of all the points that I've said before about the MVQ and the AM2. But most importantly as well, the college, so City College, hadn't um, done the paperwork correctly. So I've got a few modules missing, which also means that my diploma qualification isn't complete. So I suggest that anyone that's done the diploma route or done the apprenticeship route, check your paperwork, make sure you've got everything that's needed because you'll be surprised. Um, it's not it's not just me. I think SparkSafe License to Practice has basically started uncovering that there's thousands of people that are in this situation because uh, SparkSafe LTP, they look more at the qualifications and make sure that it's all finished, um, etc. So again, one of the reasons why I'm doing this video. Okay. So this is one of the uh, things that I want to bring you guys to. In fact, I've missed a page. Let's just go back to this. So, okay, what you guys should be able to see now 
is this wiring matters up here. Okay, uh, and this is available online. So it's, it's the IET that have done this. Um, I'll leave, this is the thing up here that you guys should be looking at. And effectively, I mean, this was done a few years ago, uh, but it talks about the apprenticeship way, which I've spoken about. That's going to college three to four years and you're on completion, you'll be a qualified electrician, it says there. Uh, also, you can do the MVQ or level three diploma as well. It then talks about the electrician's mate, and that's basically, you know, someone who's unqualified, possibly to level one or two, um, which is what these domestic installers are technically qualified to, a level two. You know, you've got to look at the, the small print there, and they usually bolt on a, a level three qualification, like the regs exam, which, you know, what does that teach? It doesn't teach you anything. Or they bolt on, um, I think that's about it actually, before they send you out. You've only got a level two testing qualification as well, 2392, I think it is. Uh, it then talks about electricians being qualified. I won't go through it all because I've spoken about most of it, but I suggest you all have a look at this. Talks about an approved electrician, okay? So again, an approved electrician is someone who's qualified and then done an further two years of qualif you know, qualifications afterwards, uh, two years experience. Then it's got domestic installer. And this is the thing that I want to bring your attention to. So since the introduction of PARP here, the building regulations, the definition of domestic installer has been established. In the electrical industry, domestic installers are not considered to be electricians, okay? They are not required to undergo the four years training as an apprentice has to. However, Many electricians are registered domestic installers. So it says here that a domestic installer is generally expected to have a minimum understanding of installing new installations. So again, 15 days training, really what are they gonna be teaching you in that? And a current edition of the regs exam, which anyone can take that exam. You don't even need to be an electrician. I've heard of people in the office taking that exam just to see what it's about and passing with flying colors. And here is the problem. The level of experience that a domestic installer may have varies very broadly. And this is another reason why I wanna do this set of videos because we have a real issue in the industry with the broad experience and range of electricians. So it says here, many domestic installers are fully qualified electricians and have a wealth of experience in the electrical industry. However, there are also many who have not completed an apprenticeship or gained the equivalent qualifications and experience as an electrician. In fact, there are centres that provide training for people new to the electrical industry with no prior experience whatsoever. OK, and then they hand out these these things. So either a current level three award in the requirements for electrical installations, obviously it's 18th edition, and either a level three award in initial verification and certification, so that's the 2392 or EAO equivalent, or a level three award in approving electrical work in dwellings and compliance with building regulations. So again, there's a buildings regs course, which is only 16 questions or something stupid. It's, it's pathetic, it really is. These qualifications can be achieved relatively quickly with a recommended learning period of around 100 hours in total. That could be as little as three weeks, depending on centre requirements and prior knowledge. Now, one of the things that I want you guys to think about if you're thinking about coming into this industry, would you allow somebody that has only had 15 days of training come into your house where your family live, okay, and work on your electrical installation or your gas installation or, or whatever, would you allow somebody that's only had 15 days of training? I certainly wouldn't. And I know many people that wouldn't. And I, I think most of the public, if they knew that this was the case, would not allow those people into their homes. If they were phoning up for an electrician, an electrician is what they would want, okay? And I'm sure there's something in English law that says, if you pay for something, if you're paying for a service or you're requesting a service, what you think you've paid for is what you should get. OK, and I'm going to look into that more as well, because if there's a way that, you know, there's, somehow this is teetering on, you know, being against the law or, or anything like that, then I want to try and highlight that to try and bring that to the industry's attention. 
And then it goes on about notifiable, non-notifiable work, which I'll talk about in, in my uh, Part P uh, thing. Okay, um, and competence as well. I'll do that in another video. And then it goes on to talk about the different qualifications down here. And, and as I scroll through, there aren't any domestic installer courses on here that I can see. Um, I don't see them on here. So as far as I'm aware, yeah, these, these domestic installer courses really are not the way forward, according to the IET. Okay, so let's stop sharing that. So now it should have come back to this, uh, this PowerPoint. Just double check that we are. Okay. So now I'm going to talk through this Roof Divines post. Okay, now Roof works for the TESP uh, and she's also part of the ECA. So here's the, um, here's the PDF up here that you can look at. And I'll tell you what, let's bring it up. Okay, so this is, this is the post by Roof Divine. As you can see up here, this is the, um, this is the website address for it. So this is back in 2019. So it starts off, for many years now, there has been increasing concern across the industry about five week wonder electrical courses and similar training programs that purport to qualify the individuals to an industry standard, okay? Numerous employers have first-hand experience of applicants turning up with certificates from courses which they may have paid thousands of pounds for, and some of these guys, eight, eight thousand, six to eight thousand pounds, maybe more, and still not qualified, but which have no value or recognition in the industry. The individuals in question have often spent their money in the belief that they are doing the right thing, and they are usually left with limited options for employment and progression. And basically, it just goes on to explain exactly what I've kind of said to you. Employers don't accept it. You know, uh, it's really difficult to then move on. You end up paying loads of money and never really getting anywhere with it. Um, there's a key bit in here that I want to bring your attention to. So the, pr the promotional, let's go back on. <clears throat> and there's a key bit here which I want to talk about. The promotional information given by training providers may well confuse many potential trainees. Websites often offer packages labelled as gold, silver and bronze, which claim to transform an, an individual into a professional electrician. But closer inspection of the smaller print often reveals that an individual also needs to be working in the industry to achieve these levels. And also what they don't tell you is that to join a competent person scheme like the NIC, EIC or NAPIT or Stroma or Alexa, you need a minimum of two years experience within the industry. OK. And again, if you've only had 100 hours of training, that two years experience isn't really going to help much, is it? You're only going to know what you were taught in those 100 hours. So, again, I don't think that two years experience is enough. It then goes on to talk about their three pronged plan. So TSP, TESP is highly aware of the issues. And to address that, they are working on an industry proved qualifications campaign, which they aim to launch, which is where I think this experienced workers group comes in. And I'm going to talk further about that as we go through. Uh, I do have concerns about that as well, which I'll talk about. So there are, there are three main strands to this campaign. First, it is important to develop improved guidance and information on the routes into the industry, which is what I'm hoping to do with this video, and which qualifications are recognised or valued, so that those paying for training or enrolling on a full-time course understand what they are getting. Now, again, there are training providers out there that will sell you a City and Guilds 2365 course, and they'll do it in 16, 16 weeks. That is a two-year course. The level two and the level Three, City and Guilds 2365 is a two year to two to three year course. So how the hell can you do it in 16 weeks? You can't. And one of the things that I need to make you guys aware of with training, because I do teach apprentices, I liken it to um, pebble dashing a house. So when you pebble dash a house, basically you've got a big bag of stones. So that's like our information, the knowledge that we're trying to give to apprentices. 
and then you throw that at a house which has been covered in sand and cement. Now most of that will just hit, hit the sand and cement and just drop to the floor and a lot of the information that we teach apprentices does just that. So as a trainer I spend, I spend, I spend my time picking up this information and throwing it at apprentices and some of it sticks, most of it falls, okay? But over three years, you just keep picking that information back up and throwing it back at someone. And eventually it, it starts to stick and you get a good, a goodish coverage, okay? There'll be some gaps, but most of it will be covered, okay? What I want you guys to think about is how much of that knowledge is gonna stick in a 16 week course. Now I teach, I teach apprentices, okay? So in a course of a year, I will teach them three modules that they need to understand and learn. I guarantee by the end of that three years, they've probably forgotten most of what I've had to teach them. They pass the exams, but then as soon as they've done that, they forget it. And then at the end of the three years, when they're coming up for their AM2, again, you know, you've got to have a look at these apprentices because they, they've forgotten a lot of what they've they've had to learn through the course of that three years not to mention as well which is another video that i'm going to talk about that the actual pass marks in these a lot of these exams are only 50 to 60 percent okay so again there's a lot of issues that come around those qualifications but that's another video i'll talk about that later i mean how can you train somebody and then they, they can get through an exam with 50 to 60% of knowledge. That's 40 to 50% they don't know. And then they're going out into the world. So, you know, a lot needs to be questioned. Uh, again, what's it talk through here? I mean, that's pretty much it. But what I would suggest is that you guys have a look at that and then um, Have a look at that and spend some time getting to to grips with with what's going on okay so what i want you to think about is your level of competency when you're going to work in people's homes okay and i want you to think about what is the cost of a human life and why it is not being considered with these 100 uh, hour courses I was, this is, this is my own experience, by the way. So I was called out to a, a, a one-year-old, 1.8 million pound new building. And the homeowner is a good friend of mine. We've known each other at that point for about eight years. And I told him not to buy a new build. I said, don't buy a new build. The, the electrics, the standard of build is horrendous. You know, stay away from them. They literally get thrown in for peanuts. You'll have nothing but problems. But anyway, he didn't listen to me. And he spent 1.8 million pounds on a new build. And this thing was only a year old. So I, I came around to quote for some lights, outside lighting, and I'm standing at the door and instantly things are just jumping out at me. And I'm thinking, well, that's not right. That's not right. Bloody hell, what's going on here? So I point them out to him when he comes to the door. He's like, well, can you just have a look at what we've got in the garden? So I'll go out to the garden. You know, there's an SWA cable that's buried and not earthed. Okay, so, and at either end, the terminations aren't even done in glance. They're done in, um, stuffing glands and then there's basic insulation etc showing out with the uh, the outside of the lights anyway so I'm, I'm pointing all these things out and the guy says to me look can you can you do me a favor can you come upstairs and have a look at our our wet room towel rail because we keep getting electric shocks off it now the electrician's told us not to worry it's not too much of a voltage he's put his um, his electrical wand on it and he says it's nothing to worry about so I, I come up to it and stick my voltage indicator across that and the taps. Bearing in mind, this is a wet room and these, this, this, uh, this is in zone one effectively. So I put my voltage indicators on the um, tail rail and the taps for the shower in zone one. And I read 70 volts. And that's only the potential difference, okay? Because I don't even know how well those pipes were earthed or the tail rail was earthed. So it may have been a lot higher. <clears throat> anyway, I started thinking, why is this not tripping out? And as I start digging away, I find out that the guys disconnected the CPCs for the circuit. I go down to the consumer unit, 
to switch the main switch off and find out this guy's bypassed the main switch on the line conductor only. So when you switch the main switch off, everything goes dead or looks dead, but it's still very much live. I take the front cover off and see that that then bypasses both RCDs as well. So there's no RCD protection whatsoever. And two circuits have been disconnected with their CPC, which was one of the circuits that I was working on. And this was all signed off through building control, etc. And it had been like that for months. And basically, I think the guy had been having problems. And so he just disconnected everything. All signed off through building control. Now, when I tried to report that to their competent person scheme, which at the time was Stromer, Stromer completely ignored myself and they ignored the homeowner. I called Napit, who then spoke to Stromer on my behalf, and they still maintained radio silence. I then tried contacting the agency, but they said it's not their problem. I tried contacting Trading Standards, who said it was the local area of building control, and the local area of building control said it was the scheme's responsibility, and around and around it went, and it never got resolved. Okay, In the end, the client had to pay 16 grand, I think it was, to get this fixed. Whether or not he got the money back, I don't know. OK, but when I spoke to the builder about it, the builder said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. This is our electrician's Part P registered. What's the problem? And as far as I know, he is still installing for that building company. OK, so there is there is a massive problem that we've got here with, with training and competency and uh, it all needs to be addressed. So. Apprenticeship versus domestic installer. So again, we've spoken about that. I'll leave this here for a few seconds just so you guys can have a look at it. Um, in fact, I'll probably come back to that. I'll come back to that. So this is the apprenticeship route. Okay. This is all done by the TESP, the Electrical Skills Partnership, which Ruth is the chair for, I believe. This is the route, the preferred route. So before you start, you're employed. The apprenticeship program typically takes around four years to complete. You do not pay for your training and you will earn while you learn. Now, apprentices earn about £4.15 for the first hour. It goes up in the second year. If you're over 19, I think it is, 18 or 19, you're then entitled to minimum wage in the second year, which is £8.40 an hour or something like that. So look online and see what it is. So it's only short term loss, but it's long term gain. All these people that say they can't afford to take a pay cut, I, I think again. And also as well, these apprenticeships aren't just for school leavers. One of my apprentices from last year was in his late 50s. So, and he was doing really well. And it's great to have someone in the, in the course, on, in the course that's that good, you know, and has previous experience. And he came from banking, but still got life experience to bring into the uh, classroom. While you're there, you then get trained to the apprenticeship standard which again is slightly questionable because the exams are 50 to 60% pass marks, but they are everywhere by the looks of things. So during your apprenticeship, you'll be building practical skills and knowledge, both on the job and with a training provider. Across the four years, you'll gain the electrotechnical apprenticeship level three technical qualification, plus you'll be assessed on a wide range of performance criteria. You then do your endpoint assessment, which is the AM2S, which tests everything that you've learned during the training. OK, so it's no big surprise. It's exactly what you've learned at college. You learn that at this assessment over three days. It's easy. Anyone that, that, can, that goes into the uh, industry out of unsupervised should be able to pass this course. It really isn't that difficult. Once you've passed your endpoint assessment, your apprenticeship is complete. You are now a qualified electrician. OK, and I've kind of got it here. So we'll talk about the, the next route, which is this route here. You can see that this is the diploma route, which I took. I did the level two and three at college. And then I should have at that stage done my MVQ AM2, which I wasn't told about. Now, the annoying thing for me was I did put myself through night school, but I was working five days a week for an electrical contracting firm, which covered industrial, commercial and domestic. So I could quite easily have been put on this, but no one said anything no one told me that I could do that so I should have been over here but I wasn't so again anyone looking to do this you may start on this route but then once you've got an employer you can transfer over to this route to the electrical industry route and while you're at college 
all of this gets done at the same time. Finish the AM2, now you'll qualify, okay? After that, you can move on to the level three, two, three, nine, one course inspection and testing course, uh, design and verification, which is the two, three, nine, six, and then maybe into building services, etc. This is the recognized route for employers. So the benefit of this electrical apprenticeship, one day a week of college spread over three years to help you gain the knowledge and understanding to help it sink in and earn a level three qualification. Four days a week, which is the most important part, four days a week on site, learning and practicing your trade, gaining site experience and understanding of building construction, as well as best practice from other qualified electricians. If you join the right company, you will gain insights from years of experience and learn to respect what we do. I teach apprentices and even after three years of college, getting the best training that we can provide, they still don't feel like they know what needs to be known at the end of it. And they laugh at the domestic installer group because they're like, how can they get away with 100 hours? We've done three years and we still don't feel qualified. Whilst completing the apprenticeship, you'll also be completing your logbook, which is your MVQ portfolio. Um, at the same time, which if completed correctly enhances your technical ability because you learn to speak and talk like an electrician. You learn to you know, explain what you're doing reflectively in a way that somebody that doesn't know what they're doing can say, look at that and say, yep, that person knows what they're talking about. So in that logbook, you have to talk about pictures, you evidence, sorry, jobs, talk about work and you evidence it with pictures, reflective accounts, other means, okay? That then enables you to do the AM2 assessment. You've now earned your right into the industry. You're a fully qualified electrician. You don't have an employer at this point, but you'll start at level two. If you don't become employed and move into an apprenticeship, you then can then progress to level three. So what they're suggesting there is that at any point you can, you should get over to the domestic, uh, to the, at any point you can, you should get over to the, the um, apprenticeship. Again, each technical qualification takes around a year to complete and to complete the full process to qualify, the electrician stage will take around four years. So this would be the 2365 City and Guilds or EAL equivalent. Now, again, if it talks about doing it in four years here, why are there companies selling it in 16 weeks? You've got to ask yourself what's missing, okay? Compare apples with apples. I keep saying that every single time. At the end of that, once you've done those technical qualifications, you then get into the industry as with an employer. And then, so you secure employment, finish the apprenticeship standard by completing your MVQ, AM2, qualified electrician. Simple as that, okay? So the benefits of this, three days a week of college or two evenings a week spread over a minimum of two years. Again, it should say four years to help the knowledge and understanding sink in and achieve a level two qualification or level three. So maybe the two years is level two, level three is three years. College costs around £800 per year. Okay, so it's more manageable. You don't have to get yourself in debt. Because you haven't spent four days a week learning and practicing your trade though, and gaining that on-site experience and understanding of building construction, as well as the best practice, you now have to gain employment to perfect your installation skills, and build on the knowledge you learned from college. You now also still need to complete your logbook, which will be about 1,200 pounds to 2,000 pounds. So bear that cost in mind as well. And you'll have to go in through the AM2 endpoint assessment, which is about 900 pounds. So you need to consider these costs when you're looking at training, okay? Again, this is 714 guided learning hours, so six to 36 months to achieve, depending on the work range. This enables you to enter the AM2. At the end of that, you're now a qualified electrician. Okay, so as I was saying, that there's this, this is the self-funded route into the industry. So it's almost identical to the full-time course at the 16 to 19 year olds, except it isn't three days a week, it's probably in the evenings, two nights a week. I, uh, when I did it, it was Tuesday nights and Thursday nights, six till nine in the evening. And I paid somewhere between four or five hundred pounds a year for that course. OK, so it is a very reasonable course to go on. Now, the good thing is about this course is that you don't need to be in employment um, and you do the, exactly the same qualifications as you would with the um, apprenticeship route. 
you do your level two diploma, which is the route that I took, the diploma in electrical installations, city and guilds or EAL. You do a level three diploma, which is again, city and guilds or EAL. And at any time within these two to three years that you gain employment, you can then transfer that over to the apprenticeship. OK, so you're not losing anything. In fact, what you could do is if you don't want to take the pay cut in the first year, what you could do is sign up for this diploma route, do one year in the evenings and then in the second year, get a job for minimum wage, which if you're over 19, I think is £8.40 an hour. OK, and literally go straight from evenings, transfer over to a full time apprenticeship and then you're doing one day a week of college four days a week on site learning the trade but most importantly not only learning the trade but also completing your NVQ which would otherwise cost you a further two you know 1,000 to 2,000 pounds at the end of the course and your AM2 endpoint assessment which is about 900 pounds okay which would be an extra cost so all of that would then be included in the apprenticeship so this is a great way for people like me who wanted to change career they wanted to get into the industry, but they, they, they couldn't afford the pay cut or they didn't have the job to go to. You can sign up for this course, start ticking off the exams and the modules, learning the information slowly over a period of three years, two to three years. And that way it's got more chance of sticking because if you do something, the slower you build something, the, the harder it is to tear it down. OK, it's the same with building houses. If you build it slowly, but right and get the foundations correct from the start, that house will stand a better chance of uh, surviving for a very long time. Whereas if you literally throw it up really quickly, um, it's always a problem. There's always things wrong with it. And it's the same with this qualification, with this training. But the best thing that you guys can do is, is get involved on this course before you get the job. Do the level two, get a job. If you can't do the level three, get a job and get that transferred over to a full-time apprenticeship as soon as you can. And probably for most of you, um, the people looking to change careers, the second year, your wages goes up to minimum wage, like I say. At this point, if you don't get a job, what happens? You end up here, which is where I am, and I didn't know that. Um, you then need to build your MVQ. And I could have easily have done that by now, had I known. Um, and the MVQ, if you're not an apprentice and you're doing the self funded route, this is between sort of a thousand pounds to two thousand pounds to get done uh, then you've got the endpoint assessment which is a further 900 pounds before you're finally considered qualified in the in the uh, industry um, so again this is equally as good if it's done correctly if it's administered correctly by the college that are training you if it's done over a longer period of time to allow that knowledge to sink in you know think back to my pebble dashing your house analogy you know the longer we have you the more information we throw at you but the more it sticks over that period we can fill in all the blanks if you only do 100 days of training there's only a limited amount the bare minimum just to you know it's, it's not going to work it's not gonna work. there's no way of dressing that uh, to make it sound any better so again those of you looking to do change career this is the route okay the preferred route to go down and then there's the experienced worker route which is if you've got five years of experience you can then use that as a skill scan against then going into the and doing an MVQ and then doing the AM2 assessment. But I will talk about this later because for me, I can see there's going to be massive problems where this is concerned. And I really believe that this is a way of slowly getting rid of domestic installers and trying to get them change domestic installers into qualified electricians and, and you know I'll talk about that later but I can see it being abused and it so it needs to be careful I mean in any assessment guys whatever it is you're doing you've always got to do a risk assessment of what you're planning on doing and someone needs to sit down and look at this objectively and say right what are the risks to us doing this what are the solutions to stop those risks from happening you know, what are the hazards what's the risk assessment What's the method statement? And something needs to be looked at, I think, with that. <clears throat> okay. I'd like to finish with basically, those are, your, those are your preferred routes into the industry, okay? And they will make you electricians. And then in my next video, I'll talk about the domestic installer courses. 
But what I want to try and get across to you people as well is there seems to be some kind of stigma in the UK that single phase domestic electric is a lesser danger and not as highly regarded as free phase suppliers. And that's how they sometimes somehow justify these domestic installer courses that we're going to talk about. And I find it bizarre because it isn't so much the voltage, it's the current. And 10 milliamp is your let go level, 50 milliamp is your fibrillation level. So what difference does 230 volt or 400 volt make when you're talking about low levels of current. Now I know the voltage lowers the impedance of the body, but still, if you get that level of current through you, you're dead, okay? And there's a few people that have died unnecessarily due to dangerous installation or practices. So there's further Witter, which I'll talk about another time because I'm conscious this video has been going for a while. There's Emma Shaw case, okay, where the QS needs to realize that they're responsible for the electrical installation, not the company. There's Michael's story. Um, so there's Michael um, was basically an electrician. He didn't safely isolate, cut through a cable, started stripping in the end, got an electric shock and, and died. And now his sister, uh, Louise Taggart, goes around the country talking about, or talk, going around the world, talking about Michael's story. And it, her, her story is, is one that's close to my heart because I believe in safe isolation. Um, and then there's Mary Werry, the daughter of MP Jenny Tong, who, who died. And that's one of the reasons that they'd say that Part P came around, which it isn't, but it kind of happened around the same sort of time. But effectively, the um, person who installed the electrics didn't follow the prescribed zones. Someone fitted a metal shelf or something like that, and it, it got electrified. And here I'd like to finish with, with, would you have someone in your home who has only received 15 days of training. In 2004, it was estimated there was an average of 41 fatalities to 2,740 serious injuries and damages to 6,325 properties each year from electricity. Okay, and you're going to let somebody in your home that's done 15, out, 15 days of training, questions need to be asked. Okay, and again, if you're looking to come into this industry, you've got to go ask yourself the question, how much is 15 days of training going to give me? Do the routes that I've showed you, do the apprenticeship, do the self-funded route. If you're a career changer, go to college, whatever it is you have to do, but do it right. Don't help devalue this industry. Make it better, make it stronger, because when you devalue something, it becomes worthless and you won't be able to char charge the money that electricians should be charging. Okay, so in my next video, I'm going to discuss the domestic installer route, okay? I'll compare some of the available courses, the guided learning hours, and the total qualification time as opposed to an apprenticeship. I'll talk about the cost, what you get for your money, because some people paying six to eight thousand pounds, ending up in debt on finance and still not qualified at the end of it. Uh, and if you've got any questions, just email me or say hello on the YouTube and I'll get back to you and maybe do a video about it. And if there's anything that you guys want to help me point out or things that you want me to talk about, then please send them through. I'll look at it. We'll go on this journey together. And then I've got some more videos to come. So I'm going to talk about part here, the building regulations. Where did it come from? The fast track training. What is the problem? Discuss the devaluing of the industry. Why are these companies supporting each other? And how do you measure competence? Why not qualify? So that's just a few that, I'm, I've, that are in the pipeline that I've got sort of already marked out. I just need to tweak them. Right, okay, guys. So my last thought of the day before we call this uh, and enter this meeting. If you're gonna come into this industry, it is an amazing industry. I absolutely love my job. I love working on the tools. I love meeting people, okay? Um, it is an amazing industry to get into. And if that's what you're looking to come into, then think about your route into it. Because if you take a fast track course or a short course and you, know, you become part of the problem, okay? Not part of the solution. And electricians wages have been declining for years. So like I told you at the beginning of this film, video, um, electricians were fighting about the de-skilling of the industry in 2011, okay? When Besner were trying to force it through. And, they were talking about fighting for £16 an hour as fully qualified electricians. Well, that rate 
still may be held up by the JIB if you're lucky enough to work for a JIB company. But still, 10 years later, wages haven't gone up. They're still £16 an hour. If you're not working for a JIB company, I've seen jobs advertised for £10 an hour as an electrician. And for the amount of training that we have to do and keeping up with CPD, that's not far off of minimum wage at £8.40 an hour or whatever it is these days. And I can't help feeling that this is all linked. You know, you give someone 15 days of training, they're going to work for less money because they've got less knowledge and they're going to do a different job to somebody who's had four years of training. And that really makes a huge difference. OK, so if you're going to come into this industry, do it right, do it properly, get the qualified electrician status by completing an apprenticeship or the level two and three diploma with the AM2 endpoint assessment at the end of it. Get your NBQ filled out. Don't pay somebody else to do it. Do it yourself, because if you are any good, you should be able to breeze through that easy. OK, and finally, you know, take care of each other and, you know, let's make this a better place to live in. Take care.